Well, hello once again and welcome to the Disability Law Show. Good to have you along for the entire 30 minutes. Please stick with us. We'll, uh, we'll teach you quite a, few, quite a bit of stuff about disability law for sure. John Scholes here hosting and Tamara Gopian is back once again. The boss is here. Sam Fury, Tamar can LLP. Anytime you want to reach out to Tamar and her very capable team, you're always invited to do so. Write the number 1-855-821-5900. Email, which we'll get to a little later on the show, is simply help at disabilityrights.ca and you have the option of my disability disabilityquestions.com. Main topic on the show in just a bit, three things you need to know if you're waiting for treatment and applying for LTD. That's in just a little while. We'll get to some phone calls as well from our radio show. And we always kick things off uh, tomorrow with the week that was our case of the day. Something going on in your end, pal. What you do you know, got today? My notes say relay a success story, John, and success comes in many different forms in the work that we do day in and day out. And what I thought was really particularly a highlight for my week this week was a woman who contacted us uh, well before her claim was actually denied. And, and she contacted us, you know, in a somewhat sheepish way in the sense that she was very, very anxious. She was really not certain whether this was the right time to contact our firm to talk about her disability claim. And of course, as we encourage everyone at any point, we're happy to speak with you. It is okay to talk to us because we really want to get as much information out for people as we possibly can as it relates to their disability claim so that they're ready. It doesn't mean that they're obligated to retain us. In fact, not at all. Uh, it really is just an information gathering process. So I wanted to start off our show really talking about her, talking about what was her background. So she, was, she is in her late 50s. She worked at a nurse, uh, as a nurse in the province of Ontario for a very long time. And she, as COVID hit, was getting worse symptoms for what we call Crohn's disease. Uh, this is an immune compromised condition. It requires very heavy medication to control and treat. And because she was immune compromised, obviously this created a lot of issues with her in the work that she was doing as a nurse. At the time, she was actually placed in a long-term care facility. And we all know how devastating that was in our province just a few years back. We haven't forgotten about that. And nurses really bore the brunt of a lot of that. So not only was she exposed from a health perspective, but not surprisingly, there were some underlying mental health conditions that sort of built over that time frame. But all the credit to her, she actually worked with her employer to try and accommodate her health and her situation before she even initiated her disability claim. And she decided to do some public health work, uh, re working remotely away from the patient care for some time. But even that became too hard for her to do. And ultimately her doctor said, enough is enough. You need to start a disability claim and a disability application. So long story short, she was actually approved for a period of time. And so she was approved for the own occupation period. So. The insurance company, that means, accepted that she was not capable of doing her work either as a nurse in facility or in the public health work that she was doing thereafter. And to her credit, she continued to cooperate with the insurance company's requests and all of the things that they needed to continue paying her LTD benefit. But of course, it got to that two-year mark. That is really where she is at right now. And all of a sudden, she's getting all sorts of phone calls and emails. John, they send her that uh, form where she has to complete her education, training and experience background, yep. all of that information. And that really prompted her to think, well, hang on, uh, do I need to fill this out? What's the insurance company going to do with this information? And for those who watch our show, they know and understand this is the time where the insurance company needs to review what else could she do other than being a nurse, that would pay her roughly what she's getting as her LTD benefit and that would still accommodate her, her ongoing health issues. But her health issues haven't stayed stagnant. They have worsened over time. And we see this a lot with disability claimants. And her, in her situation in particular, now she is developing glaucoma. That is a vision issue. Her vision is becoming more impaired. It could potentially be related to the medication she's taking for her Crohn's condition. At the end of the day, now her profile isn't just the Crohn's disease, it's got these vision issues as well. And why is this significant? It's because I can assure you that the insurance companies fall back to her being able to do something else, John, 
is going to be some computer-based type job, some kind of desk job. They call it sedentary or light duty, but something that she can do remotely, that she can still use her skills that would, as I said, pay her less than what she was earning when she was actually working. And so, of course, she was very concerned about all of this. And I spent about 45 minutes to an hour speaking with her, explaining all of the things that the insurance company doesn't want you to know, and just reassuring her, look, if they take all of this information, including the worsening health issues, including your education, training, and experience background, and they ultimately make the decision to cut off your claim and deny you benefits past that change of definition, that is what we are here to do to help. And not just nurses in Ontario, John, we work across the country for people just like her, not only to provide that information ahead of time, to support them as they're going through this process with the insurance company, but also at the end of the day, if it gets to the point where the doctor is still recommending that she remain off work, that is really the recipe for us to start that legal claim and try and get these claims resolved. Because the insurance company is focused on getting you off claim. That is their number one focus. And the more we can do to help people, to assist them in that process, the better. And of course, our reputation speaks for itself. And so this is why I thought it was a great success story because she came to us sheepishly and nervously. And I said to her, this is the time to talk to us. And if you don't need our help, that's okay. But at least now you know what to expect as you're moving forward as the insurance company is making that claim. I think it's, it's a smart thing to do, not just in this case, but for anybody. If it's get that preemptive strike, even if they're your warning, you see in the near future that you might be cut off, that's when you make the phone call to you. Don't wait till you're actually cut off, then you're that's right. eight ball, right? Uh, uh, that's right. And, and it's so important that people know that these consultations are no obligation, absolutely free. There is no pressure there. It really is a question of finding out that information and then making some choices around what you're going to do if the worst case happens. And look, John, I, I didn't want to worry her too much, but the reality is, is that the insurer is likely setting up to try and decline her claim because they don't want to pay her until she's 65 years old. They look at that profile and think, okay, she's 57, 58. That could be another several years, seven, eight years of benefits. Her benefit level is fairly significant. And if they can try and find a squirrely way to get out of it, this is why they've embedded this kind of change of definition under these policies. They write the policies, John. You know, claimants like this nurse are not involved in what words get decided in this policy. And the insurance company implements it to its greatest advantage. It's a profit-making model. It works for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way, really, that we can counter that is to not leave that money on the table when it's legitimately owed to individuals like her that have a worsening health profile and really not the capacity to do that sort of fallback um, type job and doing an office job and this sort of thing. And always her, her doctor is the key piece of information in this. You know, even if they want to get her off claim, get her into something else, some, some sort of other work, as you mentioned, the doctor says, no, she cannot do anything yet, if that's the case. Right. He's the gatekeeper of her health. It, right? He is. But it's not going to stop them from cutting her off, necessarily. But That's right. He, he or she, right? So, right? so the doctors really are... The, the starting point right. for most of all of the analysis that we do in these types of disability claims for a whole host of reasons. I mean, for one, they're there to treat their patients. That relationship is very important for the claimant, the patient, the person that's trying to get their disability benefits. But secondly, we know that insurance companies are almost uh, obsessed to a fault in getting that paperwork. Mm -hmm. They need those papers in their files to justify month over month releasing that disability benefit. So. Having that cooperation with, from your doctor, very, very important. And we're going to touch on that later in the show in any event. PocketEmploymentLawyer.ca, wonderful website. I mentioned uh, off the top of the show, or maybe it was MyDisabilityQuestions.com. But regardless, Pocket Employment Lawyer, you're thinking, okay, that's the employment law show, the, our other show. But there's a section there, a good section on disability law, and there's a little bit of cohesion there, why we do that tomorrow. What do you think? Well, so I'm really excited about this um, pocket disability lawyer because, yes, it is uh, essentially an add-on to the pocket employment lawyer that we've had for a long time. And, again, another really effective tool to find out about your rights and entitlements in a no-obligation, anonymous way. So um, just to give people an insight as to what it is, it has a series of drop-down menus, really simple to use, no legal speak, you just put in your little, you know, what's the question that you have, and it gives you paragraph or two of free information. And, John, it actually has a section that says, do you want us to contact you? Yes or no? No? 
fine. You close out your browser, completely anonymous. But I love this idea for people because it can be overwhelming to try and figure out, okay, uh, where's my starting point? Yep. Where do I go? And these kinds of tools, again, all about pushing out information to people, information that the insurance companies don't want you to know that really will empower you to make those choices around, okay, is this the right time perhaps that I do need to speak to a disability lawyer? What does that look like? How can Sam Firu to Mark can help me in that process? And so I love this pocket disability lawyer because it is so, so simple to use and an anonymous way to figure out, look, what, what are my rights and entitlements in a situation like this? Again, can be found freely and anonymously, pocketdisabilitylawyer.ca. Check it out on your own time. As we mentioned, tomorrow night and the rest of the crew, quite a few of us actually do long running radio shows across the country. And you can go to disabilityrights.ca uh, anytime to find a station near you. Let's get to a phone call tomorrow from one of our radio shows and dissect it a little bit. My doctor says I can stop long-term disability and go back to work, but with restrictions and a shorter work schedule. Unfortunately, my employer says they can't make any accommodation whatsoever, and I have to wait until I can go back to work full-time. Will I lose my LTD benefits if I can't work? Legitimate worry right there. It, it is a legitimate worry. And I think that these are the kinds of situations where you've got a disability component and an employment component where we are well suited to provide this kind of advice, John. We specialize in disability litigation, disability law, and we specialize in employment law for exactly this reason. So let's break this down a little bit. I want to start with, of course, focusing on the disability aspect of this phone call. If the doctor is supporting that there is some work capacity, as I said before, it's key for the doctor to be really, really clear about what are the restrictions and limitations that are in place. What is it that the accommodation it has to be or needs to be? And that starts from your own doctor and the advice that you're getting from your own doctor around, look, I can go back to work but these are the hours that I can do, or these are the days that I can do, or this is the type of work environment that I need in order to get me back to work. What we don't know from this call actually is what's the nature of the disability. And so it's hard for me to give more specific advice, but you can see in a world where if it's a physical disability, for example, you want those restrictions and limitations really set out in a medical report of some kind. If it's a mental health disability or an emotional health disability or something cognitive, for example, you can see that a noisy work environment perhaps or somewhere with a lot of lights might be a problem. And so you want the doctor to support all of that in a very clear either report or some kind of form that you can then submit to your employer to talk through what it is that they can do from an accommodation perspective. It also then allows some insight to the disability insurer that this isn't just your doctor signing you off back to work willy-nilly, right. that in fact there are still some ongoing health issues that need to be addressed. And so the first part of this, this call was, is this going to mean that I'm going to lose my LTD benefits? Well, no, not necessarily, unless you can achieve potentially full-time capacity work. These disability policies have a section in it that provides for a partial work capacity. We call these rehabilitation provisions, some kind of top-up payment flows from people not being able to fully return back to work, and that top-up payment has to come from the long-term disability insurer, depending on the circumstances, mm -hmm. John, but just generally speaking. It shouldn't necessarily disentitle you from LTD altogether, unless, in fact, you've meet that, met that threshold of earnings or work capacity. That's a more nuanced um, kind of interpretation, which, of course, I don't want to get into necessarily. Let's keep this general. I think what concerns me more is the fact that the, the employer is resisting that accommodation. That resistance is a problem for the employer and the insurance company. Because let's think of a world where someone goes back to work, they go back to work and perhaps it's premature. Perhaps they and their doctor got it wrong. And they're in fact not able to fully return back to work at all. Perhaps their health issues rage or deteriorate to the point where they have to stop working altogether again. Well, guess what? that entitles you to more disability benefits. That doesn't give the LTD insurer a pass. On top of that, if your employer isn't doing what they're supposed to do, and they have a duty to accommodate you to the point of undue hardship, legal speak, forgive me for that, but if they are not working with you and saying to you, no, 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 come back 100% well and able to work, no, it, it, that's not the law, John. And so I gotta think that we wanna see this through a little bit, 
see how this individual develops in terms of both their work capacity and their health issues, and then it could be a potential breeding ground for a claim not only against the employer, but also the disability insurer, if that doesn't line up with as I said from the start, what the doctor recommended as the restrictions and limitations and the accommodation that needed to be put in place. That is a good start. We've got to take one break here, get back into it. Three things you need to know if waiting for treatment and applying for LTD. That is all coming up right here on the Disability Law Show. Stick around for it. We're coming right back. People think you should go to the government to get severance pay. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Government can only help you get minimum severance, but not everything you're entitled to. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. If your long-term disability claim is denied, should you appeal? Appeals often fail because insurance companies control the process. So long as you appeal, you're playing by their rules. You should never appeal the denial of your disability benefits. Appeals are just a mirage of false hope. Don't. That's their process. Take it out of their hands and fight for your rights with our help. Go to disabilityrights.ca. Discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think their employer can make changes to their job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Your employer can't change your pay, hours, or duties. You may be entitled to full severance pay. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, thank you so much for sticking around here on the Disability Law Show. John Scholes, Tamara Gopian, reaching out to Tamara and her team anytime. Always invited to make that phone call. If it's just for a chat, that's fine. 1 855 821 5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca. Tamara, the topic for today, I know you want to get into this. Thank Three you. things you need to know if waiting for treatment and applying for LTD. Number one, it is vital to receive the support of your doctor to be eligible for LTD. We kind of touched on this in the first uh, first. We segment. did, we did, but it bears repeating, John, sure. because it is really the starting point for most people to go down the path of actually making a disability claim. And, and this isn't just long-term. This, this can also be short-term disability benefits. So for those who may not know whether it's the right time, not the right time, really the driver is your doctor. You want to have a conversation with your doctor when it makes sense to make that assessment with you as to whether or not your health is preventing you from working. And it's not as complicated as a question as I think people expect or might assume. If your doctor is saying you can't work and that's agreed with you and your work duties, then that is the starting point of a disability claim. And what that requires is not only do you as a claimant employee have to submit your own form to apply for disability, but your doctor also has to complete what we call an attending physician statement or a medical certificate of some kind. And that form is really important to fill out with your knowledge as well as a claimant so that you understand what the doctor is saying to the insurance company as to the basis of your disability claim. Because John, they separate it out of these forms. These forms are very clever, right? They'll put in the primary diagnosis, they'll put in a secondary diagnosis, and it goes on for sort of six or seven pages wow. where it describes what are the limitations, what are the restrictions, what, you know, can they walk, can they lift? But the forms really are lining up with how the insurance company is going to review the claim and not necessarily giving the doctor an opportunity to fill in everything. So let's say in a, in a typical disability claim, it's not necessarily just one thing. So if there are a few health issues ongoing at the same time, you just want to make sure that your doctor is putting all of that information. And it's okay to go beyond the boxes or go beyond the lines, maybe put an ad on medical note or some clinical notes and records with that, because you could be at the starting point of a disability claim and maybe you're, you and your doctor don't have the answers, that's okay, but providing the insurance company with as much information as you can out of the gates will really help to fill in any gaps that the adjuster who's picking this up is looking at this and saying, yes, we think this fits within the definition of total disability. Second thing you need to know when you're going for treatment, applying for LTD and waiting for that to happen, most disability policies require claimants to seek and comply with recommended treatment. How's right. that work? Recommended treatment. Yep. So again, this is another piece of language that we see in these disability policies. So not only do you have to meet the test of you are totally disabled from doing your occupation or your job, at least out of the gates, 
but you also have to meet a secondary requirement, which is you have to try and get the treatment that you need to get better. It has to be, quote unquote, appropriate or recommended. Now, there's been a little bit of law around this, though, and what I want to give our viewers some insight, John, is that it has to be reasonable. So we, we come across this quite a bit where sometimes the insurance company is saying, well, you should take this medication, and if you take this drug, that's going to be the solution for everything, and you should be able to push yourself and get back to work. But if it's not medically required, if it's not considered reasonable for you to take, say, a certain drug, then there could be a disconnect between right. the advice you're getting from your own doctor, right, and what the insurance company wants you to do, because they are motivated to get you back to work, even if it means you gotta pump yourself up with a bunch of medication that's perhaps not great for you long-term, but that will get you back to work on a short-term basis. So yes, the requirement is there for people who are gonna claim disability to try and get treatment and access that treatment as best they can, but I want our viewers to know that it's got to make sense, it's got to be reasonable, and it's okay to push back a bit to say to the insurance company, but look, I'm going to try it this way, this is what my doctor is recommending, I'm going down that path. It's not that I'm not being compliant with treatment, but this is what the plan is. Get that endorsement from the doctor very clearly and follow that path through. If you're getting resistance from the insurance company and they might be getting it wrong, well, you know, we're only just a phone call away in a situation like that. And the third and final point, this is where a lot of people stumble, is this one tomorrow, diagnosis not necessary in order to receive LTD approval. A lot of right. people don't know that, right? <laughs> the highest court in our land has confirmed that you do not need a diagnosis in order to make a valid disability claim that's payable. So it's got to be valid and it's got to be payable. And so I still wonder why insurance companies train their adjusters to look for that diagnosis. Or even the medical reviews, John, you, we know this, sometimes insurance companies will send your file to their own medical mm -hmm. consultant, yep. uh, who knows what their credentials are, and they look at the paper and they say, oh, well, we didn't see a diagnosis here, so it must therefore mean that this person isn't that badly off. That is not the law. In fact, that's not even the test in any disability policy. The test doesn't say you need a diagnosis. It just simply says you need an illness that prevents you from working. Very simple. So. In a situation like this, it is incredibly important for the symptoms that are putting you off work to be well documented and for that treatment plan to also be well documented. Have that explained by your doctor in those details, in those forms, in those records to say, yes, perhaps we're chasing a diagnosis, but I'm still supporting that my patient cannot work until we get to that point. These are the things that we're doing to get to that point, and it's okay for us to wait for the MRI or wait for the specialist appointment. Let's say it's a psychiatrist or a yeah. neurologist. That is okay. Insurance companies get impatient, but frankly, at the end of the day, if the symptoms are there and they are disabling, the courts have confirmed that people are entitled to disability benefits. Again, reach out for this information we cover on a weekly basis on the weekly show. Anytime you want to talk to Tamara, you can do so. You can also use this, mydisabilityquestions.com, to ask your questions freely and anonymously. They will get answers, so you can check that out. In fact, that's where we're going to go after a short break as we continue with more of the Disability Law Show. Stick around. People think contractors aren't owed severance. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Many contractors are actually employees and are entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just gonna walk away. Your insurer may ignore you, they may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back. Disability Law Show again this week. I'm John Scholes. That's Tamara Gopian. I want to reach out to Tamara and her team at the firm anytime. It's a phone call away, one 821 
5900 help at disabilityrights.ca or you can go to this website mydisabilityquestions.com it's free it's anonymous it's exactly what it's laid out to do you ask your questions you can actually search through a searchable database maybe a question similar to yours if not exactly like yours has been asked and answered in the past it'll save you some time if not leave it there and it will be answered by one of tomorrow's team for sure robert is this week says i was involved in an accident years ago still have pain in my neck and back i managed to keep working but had to stop last year when i started getting chronic sinus and chest infections i applied for long-term disability over a year ago but kept getting declined despite numerous appeals what can i do the first answer here, I think, for Robert is a legal claim. John, the, the idea of numerous appeals in a, in a formula like this is just going to run down his time for actually pursuing his rights in a way that's more efficient, more legitimate, that's going to be taken more seriously. Because this really is what we've been talking about the whole show, is that you don't need a diagnosis, you don't need a real cause. That is not what disability is about. It's about a series of symptoms for someone like Robert probably the back issues or pain issues. You put on top of that these other symptoms, chest infections and sinus and so on, and that creates potentially a profile of someone who cannot work. Now look, we, we don't know his job, we don't know the age, but this really is a core argument that we make a lot with disability insurers, which is what I call a constellation, a collection of symptoms and health issues that are supported by your doctors that entitle you to disability benefits. And I don't like the idea of people running down that clock for that legal claim, doing appeal after appeal, likely to the same adjuster, John, who has said no to them time and again, because they can't wrap their head around, well, where's the diagnosis? Where's the treatment plan? It doesn't fit within that model that these adjusters are given to review these claims and either approve or deny them. And so this is why our legal claims and our help are so effective. Sometimes we can settle these things within months, John, sometimes sooner than the path that people have been on mm -hmm. down this road yeah. of appeal after appeal. And so when you've got this kind of a health profile where there's some complexity, it's not so linear, it's not like a broken arm that's very easy to diagnose and has a very you know, recommended treatment plan and course of treatment and time frame, then you do get sometimes adjusters who don't understand, are not putting the right analysis and are simply not aware of the law. When we start the legal claim, we're dealing with their lawyers, we're dealing with people who talk with us in our same language, and we are leveraging things against the insurance company, like the risks, like the law, to get an excellent outcome and result for our clients. Now, Robert's been down this road, well, he says several times, numerous, but the appeal process, we always caution people, don't even bother with that. Off the, for, off the hop, don't even go for it. it right? It's a bit of a sham. Yeah. Let's be quite honest. It's a bit of a sham because... It's not in the disability policy. There are not, no timelines or time limits for the insurance company responding to you. There's no obligation for the adjuster to change their mind or even to do anything different than just review the paperwork that you've submitted on your appeal. And so when I look at these kinds of situations, I actually get frustrated for people like yeah. Robert because he's probably been a, without funds for a long time. He says, I think over a year ago. Yeah. And imagine they are banking, the insurance company is banking on this, that you're just simply gonna give up put yourself back in a zone where you're harming your health, back to working because you're gonna be so financially desperate to do that. So give us the opportunity to help you, give us the opportunity to do that well before this appeal process. We probably could have had his claim resolved by now, John. Yep, those appeals, we don't like those. So if you take anything away from this last segment of the show, that's it, just give tomorrow and your team a call before you get that appeal, which they're gonna ask you to do anyway. Keep doing it and doing it and run that clock out. Just like we have for this show. Now you wanna reach out now that we are done for this week to tomorrow and your team, always uh, encouraged to make that phone call, 1-855-821-5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca is the email and pocketdisabilitylawyer.ca for all other information. It's free, it's anonymous, you can use that at your leisure. And for uh, past shows and our radio shows and a list of where you can reach us across the country, disabilityrights.ca is a good resource as well. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you helped out with the show this week, we always encourage you to keep writing those emails. Yours may appear on a future show, but we are done for this week. Thank you so much for watching the Disability Law Show. We'll catch you again next time.